morning, everybody. Good morning. Wonderful to look out and uh, see so many of my brothers and sisters here uh, gathered together. That's our word for the day. Right? Uh, many of you probably did not bother to watch the show Evie's Playhouse, but they had a key word, and every time that key word was said, everybody would scream and yell. And yell and so we are not doing that, <laughs> but we could. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Lord, we pray that you would guide our studies. Help us to understand who you are by opening your word, by letting it speak to us. Father, you are a God who has established a kingdom, a church, a family, a gathering of people who come together to honor you. And we pray that we've been doing that this morning and we can continue to do that as we study this lesson. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. October 13th is a date on the calendar that several people have already circled, all right? And they have circled it anticipating an event that they're going to be a part of. Well, here's the thing. People travel in from all around for this event. And there's no organizers, no planning goes into it, but it happens every single year. It's a diverse group of people. It's men, women, it's older folks, younger folks, uh, all kinds of ethnicities and, and racial backgrounds. They gather in a park to a sacred space. And their voices are hushed and they're listening. They're listening to something very specific. And then at 3.36 p.m. on October 13th, they all cheer in celebration at exactly that same time. Interesting. This gathering happens in your city, in Pittsburgh, every single year. And this is a picture of the celebration that happened in 2020. In the middle of the pandemic, they still got together. And what are they celebrating? Well, some of them have pirates, jerseys, or uniforms. And you can start to maybe think this is sports related, which indeed it is, because October 13th, 1960 was a beautiful moment in Pittsburgh sports history. Many of you, some of you, remember this firsthand. The 1960 World Series, it was Pirates versus Yankees. Ugh, the Yankees, right? Game seven. And it went and it was tied at the bottom of the ninth, right? I mean, it's like... It's like what every little kid starts to imagine, right? Here I am, it's, it's game seven, bottom of the ninth, I'm up to bat. Bill Mazeroski hits a walk-off home run. They win the game and the entire city rejoices. They, they stand up, they cheer. Uh, maybe you've seen some photos from this event. I bet you've never seen this one. 
Do you know there were some people cheering? Where could that be taken from? Because it's looking down on Forbes Field. It's taken from the Cathedral of Learning, where there were students and faculty watching from the very top of that gigantic building. It's practically a skyscraper. Uh, cheering them on. I'm not sure I could do that for the whole game, right? There would be some uh, vertigo going on there. Now, how did this start year after year? Because it wasn't from, you know, 1960 on, it wasn't every year. Back in 1985, a man by the name of Saul Finkelstein, who every article I read just calls him Pirate Fan, all right? Like that's his designation in life. He comes to the outfield wall of Forbes Field, which is all that's left of that field. Well, home plate is still there, but it, it's in a building in the floor under glass, etc. cetera. Uh, and what he does in 1985 on October 13th is he listens to the 1960 game, game seven on tape. He brings a cassette recorder, sits there, listens to the game, uh, starts it at the right time, it ends at the right time, and he sort of has his little moment there. Now, from 1986 to 1991, he says, I'm gonna do this every year. He returns every year, sits, and plays the recording by himself. And then, in 1992, Finkelstein talks about his tradition with Jim O'Brien, who's a sports writer, and he writes about it. And does a few interviews, and people begin to find out about it. That year, 1992, 25 people show up with him to listen to the game. And then, of course, that number began to grow. So over the next several years, the crowd rises to over 200 and then 200 plus. Incredible. Then in 2010, which is the 50th anniversary, 1,500 fans show up and the Pirates decide, you know what, we might as well acknowledge this. And the Pirates themselves, they honor, they invite any of the living members of the 1960 team and they honor them there. And it's quite a celebration. I mean, this is incredible. You know what's interesting to me? Saul Finkelstein dies in 2004. And yet, even today, even this year, it will still be going on, this gathering. Again, there's no planners, there's no organizers. People just want to come together to remember an amazing moment. You can make the argument that that moment in 1960 was the greatest moment in Pittsburgh sports history. I mean, it's in the top 10 for sports history, period. Maybe one of the greatest home runs in baseball. And so people want to remember it, they wanna gather, and they wanna cheer at just the right time. That's what we wanna talk about today. That same kind of spirit that ought to be in God's family, in God's people. This sermon series, uh, oh, well, I'm not gonna read you this paragraph, but I just wanted to point out to you that this is kind of a religious thing, right? Uh, he talks about this being a commemoration, a pilgrimage, sacred ground. Remember I put sacred ground in quotes? That wasn't my term. That was this guy's term who writes for the Society for American Baseball Research. Uh, these relics, home plate, the outfield, uh, they provide visitors with an ability to touch and celebrate the great old stadium. So there's this, you know, the, what I see here is the impulse that human beings have, the need to commemorate, to gather. In this sermon series, we have been looking at the church's purpose, what the church has been designed to do. And human beings are designed to gather together and celebrate. I don't know what's gonna happen with the Pittsburgh Penguins this week, but if they keep winning and then winning and winning and winning, and they win the, the Stanley Cup, will there be a parade? Oh yeah, yeah, there will be. Uh, we all know this, there's gonna be a parade. And maybe some of you will be there, right? Well, you're gonna make my way downtown. I, it's just kind of what we do. So my question is not so much, you know, does the church gather? That's the easy part, right? My question for this week is, do our gatherings accomplish their God-given purpose or purposes? So we gather together and do, does our gathering, does it accomplish what God wanted our gatherings to do? Are we doing what he wants us to do, in other words? I believe that the gathering uh, over in, in Oakland every year is accomplishing exactly what they want to do. They come to commemorate, to remember, to make sure everybody, you know, and, and then they, they sort of talk together and they reminisce about, you know, Forbes Field and how great a ballpark it was. What about our gatherings? Do they do that? 
And why do we gather? What is our purpose in coming? You know, somebody with a more secular mind who look and they say, well, what do you do? You, you go and you sit on a, on a bench, a padded bench, and you sing songs? Uh, why do this? Why do you all do this? And, and all of you know to do this? And all of you want to do this? Well, first of all, yes, we gather to worship God. That is our reason for gathering this morning. We gather so that God will be glorified. And just like the psalmist writes, we cannot help it. This is what we must do. I don't know if this was part of the words to the songs that we've read already, but, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. That's what we've come together to do. The psalm continues. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. And so, of course, when we realize and believe those truths, we have to be moved. And we find out there's people who are gathering together to make sure the nations know how great God is. Count me in. I'm going to be there. Of course, I'm going to be a part of that gathering. I can't help it. I know how great God is. There are some things that just get automatic adoration, appreciation in this life. Right? Some great works of art, for example. Take the, the statues that were sculpted by Michelangelo. Like, the, like out of one solid block of marble, he can produce something like the David. And, and when people go to Florence and they, they go to the Uffizi Museum and they see the David, people just stand there. And like, that's incredible what he was able to do. Turn you know, marble into something that looks like a human being. Another sculpture of his, uh, the Pieta, I showed this to the teens in the teen class a couple weeks ago. This is in St. Peter's in Rome, and thousands of people a day walk by to adore this. Now, some works of art are amazing, even though the display they're given uh, is not all that special. Uh, so, for example, a third sculpture by Michelangelo, the Moses. You know how hard it is to find this statue? I should know because I looked for it and finally found it in Rome. It is in a church that you've never heard of. I had to look it up again to, to find out what the name And it is back in a back corner. And not only that, but when you get there, you have to put, I was going to say a quarter. They don't have quarters in Italy, all right? But you have to put a coin in a machine to light it up. Right? That's how terrible this is. This is a sculpture by Michelangelo. I wanted to find somebody in the church and say, do you know what you have right here? This is a priceless treasure. Uh, at least leave the lights on, you know. But this, you know, you, you look at this and it doesn't even, you're, you're moved automatically. You're just moved because of the demonstration of art. But what we see in creation is the magnificent creativity and genius of the master creator, and so with David, we come and we say, oh, of course, we have to worship. The Old Testament, they were moved to worship. And Jesus says, and they're going to continue to be moved to worship. He's speaking to the Samaritan woman. She had some questions about where they should go to worship God. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so that's what we're moved to do. We are Jesus' followers. And so we want also to bring our worship to him. We want to worship in spirit and in truth. We're given the Holy Spirit inside of us at our baptism. And then we want to go to God's truth. We want to continue to have both of those operating on us as we offer to God worship. We gather to worship God. 
Take a look at Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. The writer of Hebrews says, just like back then, see, back then they should have got it. They should have looked around and realized that this was a God worthy of worship. But so often, they tripped up, they forgot, they followed after other gods. And the Hebrew writer is saying, look, you know, this, this is a God worthy of your worship. So give him the worship that he wants. And so as we gather, the question becomes, what is the worship God wants? We want to offer what he asks for. And that's it. We just want to offer him what he asks for. No forms or elements of worship that he didn't ask for. Now, that's our operating principle. You know, we're careful. We're cautious. We don't want to go off on our own opinions thinking, you know what I think God really wants? He wants to make sure we have fog machines, right? He wants to make sure we have this or have that. The thing is, <laughs> he's asked for so little. For example, sing hymns. Well, we know he's asked for that. It comes up one, two, three, four, five different times in the New Testament, just from you know, the, the books outside of Revelation. Then in Revelation, they're singing constantly. There's constant singing going on there. So he asks us to sing hymns, so that's what we do. We come here, and you expect to sing some hymns together. Online, we struggled, right, Jim? I mean, you did a great job. You song leaders did a great job. We struggled to still try to sing together. We came down with a great system. It turned out we, we figured out how to do that online, and it worked out really well. But God says, look, that's what I've asked for. Now, it may be, and let me, let me add this here. God may be fine with the things other churches have added, but we have no way of knowing until we see him face to face. See what I mean there? You know, other churches have added other things. Like I said, the smoke machines, the, you know, the fancy lights or whatever. Okay, maybe God's fine with that. And maybe when we're face to face, he'll say, Mike, you know what? All that other stuff would have been perfectly fine. But you know what? I'll be able to answer him. We only wanted to offer you what you asked for. So that's why we worship the way we do. It's not because we think acapella singing is better than other singing or better music or that's just so we prefer we're not just old-fashioned we don't just want to choose a form that's old or no it's not anything about that we just want to be cautious and say let's give him what he wants so that when we gather together for worship it's acceptable as the writer of hebrews says and so maybe we're more cautious than others but that's what we do so we gather to worship God. I hope that you came to do that. We honor him. We remember him. We remember his son by partaking of the Lord's Supper together. We want to honor him. So we gather to worship God. Second main reason that we gather together is that we gather to connect to one another. There's a beautiful book. It's called Among Friends. And I... I do you ever have a really great book, and you keep saying, I'm going to read that cover to cover, but then for your sermons, you typically just go to those certain chapters that you, you know, love, you know, especially, you know, for all those sermons that you guys can. <laughs> I'm talking about myself, okay? That's what I'm, I'm admitting here. That's what I mean. One day, I'm going to read it cover to cover, and there'll be a whole new sermon series based on it, I'm sure. It's a wonderful book. The, the plea in this book is, look, can we make the church... When it gathers together a place where people connect with each other, they feel loved, they feel cared for, feel cared for. At one of the beginning of one of the chapters, he talks about the show Cheers, which now is a little dated. Some of you have never seen Cheers or have never even heard of it. Uh, but you remember, those of you who remember, the, the opening song is all about you want to go where everybody knows your name. Where they're all, they're always glad you came, right? You walk in the door and they say, hey, Norm, you know, and they know you. That was the draw of not just, you know, the idea of a bar. That, that's the idea there. But of that show in particular, it wasn't about, you know, it wasn't, there weren't homicides to figure out. You know, it wasn't a lot of love story stuff, but it was just people, normal people gathering together and sort of accepting each other. 
So these writers ask a, a few questions. They say, look, does the God who made us relationship creatures provide an alternative to the bars, clubs, and other gathering places of the world? Wouldn't the one who created our need for others also create an appropriate environment for that need to be met? By God's design, fish swim in schools, wolves roam in packs, bees fly in swarms, quail covey, cattle herd, geese gaggle. What do people do when they gather to support, nourish, and protect each other in appropriate and godly groupings? In a word, they church. Isn't that a great image of the church, right? It's what we're supposed to do. It's we're supposed to gather together to connect to one another, to support, nourish, and protect each other, be, be there for each other, just like a, a gaggle of geese do, just like a school of fish do. We gather to connect to one another. This is such a scriptural principle that we could be here all afternoon, scripture after scripture, where the New Testament describes this. One of the best places is in Acts chapter 2. This is right after, you know, 3,000 people are baptized after Peter gives his sermon. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the, the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I'm going to underline just all of the places where it talks about them gathering and what they did when they gathered and the benefits, right? They broke bread together. They came together to pray together. They were, they were together, right? As if it needed to say that, but it makes sure we know they were together. They had things in common. They, they sold things if there was a need so that there were no needs anymore. And God continued to add to that number I love that phrase. We, we, we just think, oh, yeah, you know, their numbers went from 3,000 to 3,100. The number, think about the old song, you know, your name on the roll. There was a group. There was a gathering, and that gathering just kept getting bigger and bigger. It kept being added to. We gather to connect to one another. And here's the thing. Connection requires shared time together. It requires it. You really can't form a connection, a, a real solid connection, unless you're spending time together. That's part of being human. That's part of who we are. Uh, Hebrews emphasizes this in the scripture that we have as our theme scripture. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This passage in Hebrews is about coming together to encourage one another. If you have heard that this passage in Hebrews is about why you have to go to church, somebody was not using scripture properly. Because this is not about requirements and checking the box that you were there Sunday morning. Look at it again. Look at what he says. Stirring one another up to love and good works, meeting together, encouraging one another. Do you see the difference? Oh, I went to church, got that done for the week. Or I came together and I was encouraged. Somebody stirred me up to do those good things I had in my heart to do. And I want to honor God through all that who brought us together. That is what is in mind here. That's what the assembly is supposed to be. Connection requires shared time together. That's the only way that we come to have beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. First Thessalonians, same idea. This is now Paul. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, 
but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Again, I'm going to underline all this. We're sharing with you. Yes, the gospel. Yes, the teaching, which we talked about last week. Yes, the proclamation, which we talked about the week before. But this is different. We wanted to share our very selves. I wanted to be Paul with you, and I wanted you guys to, to be you know, in my heart as well. You became very dear to us. That means that took time. It took time together so that you became more and more dear to me, Paul's saying. And it happened because that's the way God's put it all together, that we become more and more dear to each other. That you matter to me, and I matter to you. So that's you know, number one under this. But number two, you'll notice what they were doing in Acts chapter 2 is they were meeting needs. Well, the thing about meeting needs is you have to know there are needs in the first place. You know, it, that, that, that makes sense. In order to actually help somebody with a need, you have to know those needs are there. Uh, and that needs to be shared. But so, no one's going to share their need with you until they realize that you care. And that's also why we gather together. We want to meet needs, but it begins with making sure I care about you and you care about me. Because then I can say, you know what, Friday, I, I, I have too much on my plate. Could you possibly come and, and watch my kids for me while I do A, B, and C? Well, of course. I didn't realize you had that need. But since we gathered together, and you know I care about you, all of a sudden it opened that door for me to come help you and we can support each other, encourage each other. What happens, and this is a temptation in every church everywhere, what happens is this whole process gets short-circuited. What do I mean? Well, it really begins with the institution being notified. The church finds out about a need. So now they know a need, now they go to meet the need. And what happens is we as church members begin to rely on the institution to act. Now the church is gonna do something about that. The church is gonna take care of people when they show up. And we miss those first two steps. And it's the first two that involve connection, friendship, relationship. It happens. It happens as soon as we become brick and mortar places, right? Because there's some people in the community who they literally think that picture is our church. That's what they think, it, and it's an institution. And maybe if I have a need, I'll call the church up, I'll talk to somebody, and they'll, they'll try to meet that need, okay? And that's the thing, you know, institutions meeting need can be very efficient. Developing relationships over time where you feel connected and cared for is inefficient. I admit that. The church isn't very efficient when it comes to making connections. Because efficient relationships are very superficial. Uh, uh, one group that's incredibly efficient at meeting needs is the, the Pittsburgh, you know, Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank. They're amazing. They are a machine. They, it's practically, a, it almost looks like a machine, right? It is a warehouse and they have so much food there and they serve so many people. And you, you get in there and you, you, you volunteer and you just see person after person and they're being served and it's wonderful but there's very little connection certainly the need the need is met but the connection that god intended the church to be fostering is not happening there and it shouldn't be because it's it's just a secular food bank but if we become an institution even in our efficiency or our drive to be efficient well then we're missing out on the wonderful blessing of relationship and connection that God has in mind for his people. Third, th oh, no, one, more, one more scripture here. You see this in uh, 1 Corinthians. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Care. That's the reason he brought us together as a body, so we can care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. That's the way it's supposed to be. A body connected. A body that feels the pains of the various members. Number three, encouragement. 
It's part of our connectedness together. Encouragement emerges out of those connections that we've formed because we spend time together. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Well, what are you talking about here? Well, this is acknowledging that when we head out from here, when we walk out those doors, the enemy is ready to pounce on us. Maybe he's ready before we walk out the doors, but I'm just saying metaphorically, he's ready to attack, and he never stops attacking. And he wants to pull you away from your faithfulness, from your connection to this body. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying one of the weapons God uses to protect you from the evil one is the person sitting next to you. That the person sitting next to you, you the, the person in this room, the people in this room, they are the tools God uses, one of the tools, to help you not fall away, to not fall into the unbelief that Satan wants to create in your heart. And so God says, look, encouragement, it's essential. First Thessalonians, therefore, encourage one another, build one another up, just as you are doing. I've covered a lot of those one another passages, but pretty much every one another passage, it, it, it takes for granted the fact that you gather, that you come together, that you share some life together so that you can connect, stay connected to each other. Do our gatherings accomplish their God-given purpose? Well, we've talked about two main ideas. And did you notice something? We gather to worship God. We gather to connect to one another. Does that remind you of anything? Somebody once asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest in the law? And Jesus says, well, there's two. Because <laughs> Jesus sometimes answers questions in tricky ways. He says, look, of course, love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. But the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We gather together. And when it's functioning right, when we're doing things right, we're fulfilling two of the greatest commands God ever gave us. And we benefit. We feel the blessing of it. We feel the strength of it. Because our hearts want to express worship to God. And we want to be encouraged by people who are likewise expressing their worship to God. And we also need connections with others. Because we're not... Robinson Crusoe, able to survive for however long, totally on our own, or to update that for you, not Tom, uh, Tom Hanks in, uh, in Castaway, where we're just, we're able to make it seven years on our own. We're not. We need connections with people, and so we gather to connect. So I want to end on some challenges here for us, because it's okay to just think about this in the theoretical, but what does that mean for us, for the church today, for Holiday Park? Well, number one, commit to gathering for worship. Last week we said commit to class, right? Commit to Bible class and the study of God's word that's happening here. Well, commit to gathering for worship. Be present as, as much as we possibly can together. Because then I find out about you and you find out about me and we're sharing life together. But then, you know, make our time together count there was a guy who was here uh, quite a while back now, but he would come to me and he would ask about two or three of the people that I had on the prayer list. He would specifically ask about Shauna's sister, Brooke, or Shauna's grandmother that we were praying for. And he would ask. And he wouldn't hold the list up and say, I'm, I'm going person by person. It came kind of naturally as if he actually cared. Right? Well, that's what we need to foster among ourselves. Make our time together count. So we ask questions to show that we actually do care about each other. And that begins with actually caring, which I think, I think we do. It's just sometimes we don't get around to showing it if we're running around too busy. Right? But then this was perhaps even more important, the idea of extend your church connections beyond Sunday morning. I don't know if you noticed this, but in Acts chapter 2, in Hebrews, they talked about 
every day or day by day? You see, that's our problem. One of the problems we have is that we come together for just that, this one time, right? This couple of hours. And I, I gave God my couple of hours, Mike. I, I, that's great. That's wonderful. That's number one, right? Committing ourselves to gathering for worship. But are we fostering those connections throughout the week? Are we reaching out and making sure that our brothers and sisters are not falling away like Hebrews warned about? And of course, as we are working our way through May, you should be on Acts chapter 15. I'm not on Acts chapter 15, all right? I'm behind, so if you're behind or if, if you're caught up, you're doing better than me, all right? So that should make you feel good. We gather to worship God, and we gather to connect to each other, and we can do better. We can do better. We can, we can set the bar so low that we, we just say, oh, we gathered, right? But do we make this a place where people do feel nourished and cared for? That's the challenge. Worshiping God is the primary desire of our heart, but the secondary desire has got to be and I'm developing stronger bonds with my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the blessing of the kingdom that's been established by Jesus. When he went to the cross for your sins, when he opened up the door for your salvation, he didn't just make it an individual thing. Even though we approach the baptistry individually, we go one by one into that water and we're lowered down, have our sins washed away. That's individual. But that individual right immediately is included into a bigger kingdom, a bigger gathering of God's people. We need each other even after that moment. So today, maybe you need to go through that individual choice of being baptized into Christ like Phoebe did last week. Or you may have done that years ago, but you've lost connection. You've lost you know, some of the benefits of gathering together. And maybe you need prayers. Maybe you need help to say, I want that. I want that, the blessing of knowing that when I walk in the door, everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. If that's not yours today, and you want help, if you want to renew that commitment to looking around and seeing a family, then that offer is there as well. We'll pray for you. We'll help you. We'll surround you with love if that's what you've been missing. If you need to respond, come as we stand and sing.